Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge who you are. We thank you for who you are for us in Christ and who we are to you in Christ. Lord, um, we cannot gather today without being mindful of not only the challenges of the last 10 months, but even of this past week as we see that which is the result of our natural tendency to want our way. And I pray that you would work on behalf of your people to protect us by that folly and that you would work through your people to be whatever you want us to be, to say whatever you want us to say, to do whatever you want to do through us in these days. And for that, we acknowledge your sovereignty and we thank you for your your love and control. I want to lift up uh, every person that I have known that has been very alone these last 10 months. And um, I pray that you would meet them in very special ways, whether they're watching or listening or not. I want to lift up Pastor Ken, Lord. I pray that you would give the family clear answers as to what's been going on with him. We look forward to getting him back. I know that I need him to get back. I miss him so much. And so, Father, right now, I just thank you that I don't have to talk you into being in control. You delight for your spirit to be in control. I trust you for that, to do whatever you want to do through me and through us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead, please, and take a seat. If you have a Bible, turn to um, Mark chapter 1. Thank you, Matt. Or you could take your phone and turn to the Bible there. That's something you never heard the apostles say, right? (laughs) Whip out your app and... I was raised during a time when many of the seeds of what our culture has become were sown. The 1960s was the time of the sexual revolution, the me generation. If it feels good, do it. It was a time of anti-establishment and anti-authority. How many of you remember that, that time period? How many of you would rather not? How many of you would like to, but you can't? So. It's a whole other thing. (laughs) My parents never dreamed of viewing people like pastors, priests, or the police the way some do today. Yes, there are those who have violated what those positions are supposed to represent. But I would submit that much of our culture has lost respect for those positions and the people who hold them. Being anti-authority is something that comes naturally to us. You're not the boss of me. How dare you tell me how to live my life? I can do what I want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. Don't tell me who I can love and who I can't, and so forth. We think we are far too enlightened to continue believing that there is absolute truth in matters of morality. Heck, we're even rewriting history because of it. If no one is the boss of me, then who's my boss? It's a little deductive reasoning on your part. If no one is the boss of me, then who's my boss? Me. The answer is me. I determine what the basis of my life is. I will do what I think is best. 
The scriptures have a way of describing that attitude in the book of Judges. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The God who is love has established what things are and how they work. When we embrace him and his ways, we can have healthy and beneficial lives, both individually and relationally. It's kind of like interacting with the laws of gravity and aerodynamics. If you do so properly, you can get in an airplane and fly anywhere in the world. Heck, you can even leave Earth's orbit in the right kind of vehicle. But if you decide to mess around with the laws of gravity and aerodynamics, by deciding you're going to jump off the roof of your house with an open umbrella, you're going to go splat. Consider the splat of our day. Just look around. How's all this self-driven, self-authority type stuff working for us? How healthy is our culture? Have you seen the news? How about our families? What about our children? John Mark has begun his gospel by giving us an inside scoop, as Pastor Dave said last week, on who Jesus really is. John the Baptist and God himself are on record that this person is the Son of God. Now, knowing who he is sets up the very first thing that Mark wants us to know about him. He has authority. The remainder of Mark chapter 1 contains five scenes that depict different aspects of Jesus' authority. And this is something that we must understand and apply for our sake, the sake of our families, and our culture. He begins like this in verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark's gospel begins with these snapshots of Jesus' life and ministry, things seem to happen very quickly. For example, Mark begins his description of Jesus' ministry with a passing reference to the fact that John the Baptist had been arrested. He doesn't go into any detail here. He simply makes reference to the fact that it happened. After it happened, Jesus begins his ministry. And Mark tells us he does it by proclaiming the gospel of God. The essence of his message was that a critical time had now come in human history. Specifically, that the kingdom of God was now a present reality on planet Earth. And people were to respond appropriately to that fact. The kingdom of God is the reality of his rule in the lives of people, made possible because now King Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, had come to Earth. Jesus' message was one of truth that required a response. The command is repent and believe. That is, change the way you think in such a way that it changes the way you live. And trust me, think of repentance as turning from self and turning to Jesus. Repentance is absolutely necessary for knowing the kind of life we truly have in Christ. We need to have our minds changed, renewed by his truth. Our affections need to be changed by his desires and our wills yielded to his will. And our willingness to embrace all of that is repentance because it's not what comes naturally to us. And our trust in him is absolutely essential in that process. So Mark continues, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending the nets. He immediately called them, And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. 
This is the first evidence of the effect of Jesus' authority on people. He called people to follow, and they followed. Now, consider the effect of this call and their response on the lives of those men. They would never be the same. They would be forever changed by what Mark records here. Because of the one who called them, they would become fishers of men, not just fishermen. And the world has been forever changed because of that call and their response. Jesus' call changes the paths of people's lives. One commentator named uh, Dave Garland wrote it this way. He says, quote, The call and the instant response of these fishermen reveal something of what discipleship to Jesus entails and should shatter our comfortable world of middle-class discipleship. Disciples are not those who simply fill pews at church, fill out pledge cards, attend an occasional Bible study, and offer to help in the work of the church now and then. Ouch. They're not merely eavesdroppers and onlookers. When one is hooked by Jesus, one's whole life and purpose are transformed. When Jesus calls, will you follow? If not, there is no hope for you. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. Another aspect of Jesus' authority over people, or rather his effect on people, is how they responded to his teaching. The people of Capernaum were not only amazed, it says they were astonished. This Greek word means that they were alarmed. They were thunderstruck. Now, shouldn't that always be the response when the Spirit of Jesus engages a person who's really willing to hear what he has to say? Should not a person be alarmed when they understand their desperate need for Jesus? Shouldn't they be amazed by the truth of God's immeasurable grace providing forgiveness and life in him out of his love for us? It was that love that sent Jesus to the cross. How should we respond to his finished work, his glorious resurrection, and our union with the living, indwelling Christ? Do we get excited about that? Do we get excited like some of us will get excited later on today when some guy wearing a helmet puts a ball in some piece of square with a colored thing and they go, yeah! And we hear in church and we go, and I walked out of that grave. Yawn. <laughs> Words like awe, <laughs> joy, worship, amazement, gratitude, devotion, I barely scratched the surface of how a soul can respond to Jesus. Those words are like drops of water compared to the ocean. Now, Mark doesn't tell us the content of Jesus' teaching. He does tell us how he taught, as one with authority and not like the scribes. In Jesus' time, there was a lot of preaching that really wasn't preaching. It's not like that today, is there? See, in those days, the rabbis, or rather, yeah, the rabbis would get up and they'd refer to other rabbis. It was very academic. You know, this rabbi said this and this rabbi said that. Jesus didn't preach that way. He said, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And that's a radical difference from what those people were used to in that culture. And sadly, I think it's a radical difference from what happens in most American pulpits. You and I have to be careful to make sure that the preaching and the teaching that we listen to is the word of the Lord. Why? Because the first aspect of Jesus' authority is this. His words powerfully affect people. That's the first. Here's the next. He has authority in the spiritual realm. Amid this incredible teaching, another aspect of Jesus' authority becomes very clear. You know the devil hates the light of God's truth. Why? Why? Because it exposes the lies that his darkness, that cause his darkness. Here's Jesus preaching like no one has ever taught. And out there among the pews is a man possessed by a demon. 
And immediately, Mark says, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. That means a demon or demons. And he cried out, what have, I to, what, have we, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It is not the man who cries out. It's the spirit in him. And notice that the demon knows exactly who Jesus is. And that demonstrates to us a very troubling truth. You can know who Jesus is. But it's not going to benefit you unless you respond properly to that truth. It requires a choice to respond properly to who he is. My old pastor used to say, people do not reject Christ because they have explored him. They reject him because they have ignored him. A person refuses to bow before the Son of God at their own peril. Well, that's not a very comfortable message to hear. It's not my message. That wasn't my idea. It's God's message. You and I reject Christ, ignore Christ at our peril. The demon tries to fight against Jesus' authority by saying, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is no expression of reverence. This is an attempt to fight back. You see, in that culture, the idea was, if I knew your identity, adversary, that gave me an advantage. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Without a struggle, without breaking a sweat, Jesus dispatches the demon, and the man is set free. Jesus has been doing that for people for the last 2,000 years. His words would not be considered polite. I think this, what I'm about to tell you proves that Jesus was from Jersey. <laughs> Shut up and get out. It's pretty much what those words agree. Shut up and get out. And this demonstration of his authority over the spiritual realm verifies his teaching and causes even more amazement on the part of the people. A major reason that Jesus did the amazing things that he did was to verify and validate everything he said. You and I choose the authorities in our life. Did you know that? We choose the authorities in our life. Whether it's the media, Facebook, CNN, Fox News, whatever, our desires, other people's opinions, isn't it best to have the only authority be the person who spoke and demons fled? Isn't it good to remember that all the evils of this world and of hell itself don't stand a chance against Jesus? He has authority over the spiritual realm. His words powerfully affect people. He has authority in the spiritual realm, and he has authority in the physical realm. We continue. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. We've seen the authority of Jesus' words and his authority over the unseen spiritual realm. Now we will see a picture of his authority in the seen physical realm. We also get a picture of his compassion. He has authority to make demons flee, yes. But also he cares enough to meet our physical needs. When Jesus learns about the illness within Simon Peter's family, he heals his mother-in-law. 
And this has a consequence of spreading news about him all around the town via the grapevine. And all these sick people show up, and he heals many of them. Jesus cares. Jesus is compassionate. And that troubles us. Because what do we do when we know he's in control, when we know what he's capable of, when we're told that he is compassionate, but he does not heal us or the ones we love? Remember that our Lord never does anything that is contrary to his character. It is very easy to be so focused on what we want for him to do that we miss what he is doing. You and I need to see with the eyes of faith what he is always doing. He's always sustaining, always equipping, always present, always loving. There's a song that says, when you cannot see his hand, trust his heart. The compassionate Christ has authority in the physical realm. Now here's the fourth. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place where he prayed. Well, where's the authority here? Well, hang on. You'll see it in a second. I want to pause here because the fact that Jesus prayed amazes me. I mean, why would he need to pray? He's God, isn't he? Yes, he's God, but he's also human. In fact, he's the perfect human. And a perfect human is completely submissive to and dependent on God. He demonstrates that by the very fact that he prays. Go into the hallway and look at our core values and what it says about prayer. We value prayer because it's an expression of our utter dependence upon God. And Christ as a human being, as the perfect man, expresses that dependence and his submission to his Father. As a matter of fact, you can't exercise authority without it. Now, we haven't really defined authority yet, have we? Let's do that. Authority is the ability to exercise power or influence over something or someone. Want to hear that again? Authority is the ability to exercise power or influence over something or someone. Dependence on and submission to God are absolutely essential for the exercise of whatever authority he gives, whether it's us or Jesus. As a man, Jesus Christ was submissive to his father. A fact that of all people, a Roman centurion understood. You know the story. The centurion sends a, a proxy to engage Jesus Christ because he has a servant that he loves that is sick. And the message to Jesus is basically, would you heal him? Jesus is like, okay, let's go. I'll come to your house. No, no, no. You don't understand. That, that centurion doesn't want to put Jesus in that kind of a position, being a Gentile. Lord, it's not necessary. Just say the word. My servant will be healed. Now, why, why did the centurion know that? Listen what he says to Jesus Christ. Listen very carefully. Say the word, my servant will be healed, for I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Do you hear it? The centurion doesn't say to Jesus, look, just say the word. You don't have to come. Why? I know that it'll happen because I'm a man with authority, and you're a man with authority. That's not what he says. He says, I'm a man under authority, and therefore I can exercise the authority given to me. And I see the exact same thing in you, Jesus. You also are a man under authority. Whose? Whose authority was? That's an audience participation question. <laughs> Whose authority was Jesus under? His father. Therefore, he could exercise the authority that his father gave him. The centurion understood that. You don't have to show up. Just say it. That Jesus prayed is a picture of his submission to and his dependence on God. And that's how he's able to exercise the authority he has. If Jesus, therefore, expressed his dependence on God in prayer, how much more should I? Amen. 
And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus' prayer time is interrupted by people looking for him. If you're in ministry, you know what that's like. And when they find him, they basically say, what are you doing here? We got a great thing going on in Capernaum. There's no time to hide. Their behavior is completely understandable because if you realize that they have perceived that God has been working among them. Whether it's the Lord Jesus Christ or any servant of God, there will always be a demand from people. And so it's logical when you realize how needy people are, but there's a danger in it. There's a few dangers in it. One of them is this, that the people you serve can become what determines your ministry rather than the Lord. God's people must be driven by what he wants done, the way he wants it done, when he wants it done, for his purposes and for his glory. It must be God who directs ministry. And that was true of Jesus. That's why Jesus said to us, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's that's how you get burned out. The other danger, especially for a guy like me who used, you know, is a performer, you know, and stuff. And don't think the preachers don't perform because they can fall into that trap too. That's why you got to pray for them. But the other danger is how intoxicating and how influential people's, people's, people's response to you and to your abilities can be. You hear that? It can be intoxicating how people respond to you. Popularity can be a tyrant. He's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, not Jesus Christ superstar. He was not concerned with the opinions of those whom he served. He was not driven by the needs or their agenda. He was only concerned with his father's agenda. Will it be God alone who determines you? Or not. So the fourth aspect of his authority is this. Jesus' authority trumps all other agendas. Yeah, I use the word trumps, okay? It's a good word for that. His authority trumps all other agendas. And finally, we see with his authority how it reacts to his culture. And a leper came to him, imploring him, And kneeling said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Our final scene is perhaps the most personal and poignant. At that time, there was nothing more terrible for a person to contract than leprosy. To be a leper was to be rejected by people your family, culture, and even your religion. If you were a leper, you were required to call out to anyone who came close to you, unclean, unclean. You were alone, and you were forsaken. You were to live as if even God himself wanted nothing to do with you. This person must have had two Very powerful things combine for him to even think about approaching the Lord Jesus Christ. First, the level of his desperation, and secondly, his conviction that Jesus could do something about it. This man takes an enormous risk in coming to Jesus. How will he respond? Will he run away? Will he throw rocks at me? Will he reject me too? You know, it can be very risky to be willing to take Jesus for who he is. To come to him just as you are and be willing for him to have his way in your life can be risky. So why would you ever think of doing it? Well, that depends on your level of desperation and how much you think he's willing to be who he is for you and what he can do in your life. The same thing that drove this leper. To say that Jesus' response to this man was shocking and unprecedented does not do service to how profoundly countercultural it was. It's hard for us to understand that because of the differences between that culture and ours. But let's look at it more closely. 
The man's doubts about how Jesus will respond are captured in the words, if you are willing. He knows Jesus can, but will he? And in response, the Lord says, I am willing. Be clean. And then he does something unthinkable. He touches the leper. This is Jesus' authority overruling culture. It doesn't matter what any person, any group of people would say, the Son of God is unaffected. What drives him is his love for the leper and his knowledge of who he is to his Father and who the Father is to him. And the result is the touch of cleansing. No matter how much of a mess you have in your life, whether by your doing or someone else's, Jesus is willing to meet you in it. Why? Because as in the case of this leper, his heart is one of compassion. Whatever hurts, whatever still damages you from the past, hear this. He will respond to you with compassion when you come to him. Years ago, a Christian songwriter named Wayne Watson wrote these words. Smile. Make them think you're happy. Lie and say that things are fine. And hide that empty longing that you feel. Don't ever show it. Just keep your heart concealed. Why are the days so lonely? I wonder where can the heart go free and who will dry the tears that no one sees? There must be someone to hear your silent dreams caught like a leaf in the wind looking for a friend. Where do you turn? Whisper the words of a prayer and you'll find him there. Arms open wide, love in his eyes. Jesus meets you where you are. Jesus heals your secret scars. All the love you're longing for is Jesus, the friend of a wounded heart. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged them and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. And he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter any town, but went out in desolate places and the people were coming to him from every quarter. Great. Jesus heals the guy and the first thing he does is disobey. kind of like us. What happens with the leper is a picture of what happens with every person who allows Jesus to touch them. They're cleansed. The Son of God came to provide cleansing from the stain of sin for every human being. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Pastor Jim Simula of the Brooklyn Tabernacle told a story when I heard, met him years ago. I was at a conference in Spartanburg, South Carolina. This has got to be almost 30 years ago. He tells a story of how on an Easter Sunday, a man walked up to him after the last service. It had been a long day. I want to, as best as I can recall, to tell you what we heard him say to us that day. Pastor Simula said, he approached me. He was filthy. His hair was matted. I could smell the stench of him before he got within six feet of me. He smelled of urine, vomit, and the street. I thought to myself, great. This guy's going to try to hit me up for money, and I just want to get out of here. I reached in my pocket to give him a few bucks and sent him on his way, and the guy put up his hand and said, preacher, I don't want your money. I need this Jesus you've been talking about, or I'm going to die out there. And Simbola said, at that moment, I was so convicted of my attitude and of my sin that I reached out, took hold of the man, and embraced him. 
The guy put his matted head on my chest, and the Lord put this thought in my mind. Do you smell that? That is the stench of the world that Jesus died for. And suddenly, that stench became a sweet fragrance to me. When I heard Pastor Simbola tell that story many, many years ago, that man had come to faith in Christ and was a custodian on the staff at Brooklyn Tabernacle. Jesus touched that leper and cleansed him. And he touched a leprous sinner named Joe Feraldi and cleansed me too in the February of 1979. Have you allowed him to touch you? No matter what the culture, no matter what your family or even you think, Let Jesus be who he is in your life. The fifth aspect of his authority is this. Jesus' authority overrules culture. Keep that in mind in the next few weeks. In April of 1984, I did a stupid thing. I accepted the invitation of a friend of mine to do some white water rafting on the Delaware River in Franklin, PA. There had been a lot of rain, and what was supposed to be a four-hour little thing down the Delaware River became 90 minutes from hell. (laughs) We were flying. Do you have any idea what 38-degree temperature weather feels like when it splashes up and hits you on the face? How do you think it would have gone if my friend and I had decided that we were going to paddle upstream against the authority of that flood? To do so would have been frustrating, exhausting, and even dangerous. So what did we do? We just let the river do whatever was going, and we enjoyed the ride. When we do not respond properly to Jesus' authority, there will be problems. There will be chaos. There will be disaster we will go splat. And when we respond rightly to who he is and his ways and the fact that he is, in fact, the boss of me, then our lives will know purpose, joy, peace, and individual and relational well-being. Jesus is Lord. Not only that, he is Savior, and he is willing to cleanse us and save us from sin and self every day. He loves us so much that in submission to his Father's authority, he took our sin and the sinner that we were to the cross so that we could have a relationship with the Father and live the life we were meant to live. What will you do about your own natural aversion, and me too, to being under authority? What will we do about Jesus's authority, especially when things don't go our way. Why wouldn't you want to be under the authority of such a one as Jesus after knowing who he is, what he has done out of his love for you, and what he is willing to be in and through you today? The very first thing that Mark wants us to know about the Son of God is that he has authority. His words powerfully affect people. He has authority over the spiritual realm. He has authority over the physical realm. His authority trumps all other agendas. And his authority overrules culture. The bottom line is we have hope when we let Jesus have his way. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your profound goodness to us. And I pray that you'd meet us as we close with a song of worship and as we listen to these words and more importantly I think listen to what you have said just do with us whatever you need to do do with me whatever you need to do I'm the one that preached this and I probably need to be the one who hears it the most we acknowledge that we have no hope unless we are yielded to Jesus Lord regardless of whatever goes on around us let us remember who you are Lord Jesus, and who you're ready to be in and through everyone who's yielded to you, have authority in our lives too. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.